Okay, a few questions before we dig into this passage. How should you and I think about rulers that are over us in the civil government? What does God have to do with who is or is not over us and the amount of time they are over us in the civil government? What duties are owed to God by civil rulers, those in civil government? A more uncomfortable question for many believers, especially today, after all the craziness since COVID happened and the government reaching farther and farther and farther in our society. The question is, what duties do we owe to civil rulers who are over us? All of these questions are answered or alluded to right here in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. This is Saul being selected as king by them casting lots. And so for all intents and purposes, think of casting lots like rolling dice. What seems random to us is done to show that the Lord is sovereign over this specific man that is being chosen to be king. Now Samuel, the prophet, already knows Saul has been chosen to be king. Do you remember this? The Lord already told him, showed him. Saul himself already knows he's going to be king. But lest God's people come together at Mizpah and then think, wait, how do we not know that it's just Samuel who wants Saul to be king? The Lord says, bring everybody together and you'll cast lots over all the tribes. It'll be his tribe. It'll be his clan. And then the lot will finally fall on this man, Saul, so that all of the people will clearly know the Lord has sovereignly chosen this man to be the first king of Israel. Now, I want you to look at the context of this passage. And really, the context is verses 17 through 19 in 1 Samuel 10. What we're really going to focus on is verses 20 through 27 and see what we learn about the civil government and everything that has to do with that here. But look at the context. Chapter 10, verse 17. Now Samuel, who's the prophet of the Lord, called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. And he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God. Who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses? And you have said to him, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Okay, so the people of the Lord assemble at this place called Mizpah. And if you remember, as you've studied through or as we together have studied through 1 Samuel, this is the place that they were just a little earlier and where they actually had this assembly and they all repented. They confessed their sin to the Lord and perhaps the prophet Samuel has them come together and is hoping that they're also going to have that same kind of repentance. Maybe there's even a pause in Samuel's speech at the end of verse 19 where he says, you've rejected the Lord. You want a king just like the rest of the nations. Gird up your loins. Stand in front of me, separate yourself by your tribes and by your thousands. And then maybe he's even hoping the people will say, we were wrong. And wanting a king and rejecting the Lord and wanting a king just like the other nations. But in the providence of God, we know they do not. They don't repent. They reject the Lord who had saved them. And Israel at this time had this special relationship with the Lord in a way that other nations have not and cannot. They are actually a theocracy and the Lord is the king of Israel. And so they have judges and prophets and priests as these intermediaries in between the Lord and the people. But he has these this direct relationship as the king of this people. But they say, we don't want that anymore. We want a king 
like all the other nations who can go out and save us, specifically because an enemy, Nahash, had come upon them and they didn't want to trust the Lord. So the Lord says, okay, I'll give you a king like all the other nations. And you need to keep that in mind. With this, the Lord showing he has sovereignly chosen Saul to be king, it's because the Lord sovereignly chose the kind of king the people asked for. The Lord chose the king the people wanted, asked for, and we could say the kind of king the people deserved. So the doctrine in this text, as we examine verses 20 through 27, when Saul is selected and appointed and given these directions, the doctrine that arises from these verses is this. The Lord providentially places rulers in their positions of authority. The righteous for blessing, the wicked for judgment, all for his glory. That's what you should learn from this passage in 1 Samuel 10, 17 through 27. The Lord providentially, sovereignly, places rulers in their positions of authority. The righteous for blessing, the wicked for judgment, all for his glory. Now start with me and look at verses 20 through 22 and learn this truth from these verses. The Lord providentially places rulers in their positions of authority. The Lord is the ultimate reason and cause that Joe Biden is your president. It's the Lord. None of it is just simply him permitting it to happen. He is active and engaged in putting up kings and taking down kings. And this is exemplified for us right here in 1 Samuel 10, 20 through 22. Now remember... Samuel already knows Saul's king. He's already anointed him as king. He's already told Saul that he's king. But the people have not yet seen a demonstration of it. And the Lord wants them to know that he has sovereignly chosen and appointed this man to be their king. And so read verse 20 through 22 in 1 Samuel 10. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near... And the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans. And the clan of the Matrites was taken by Lot. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, He has hidden himself among the baggage. So not only, boys and girls, look up here at me. What happens here in 1 Samuel 10 is the Lord is showing all of his people who he has chosen to be the very first king in Israel. And he wants to show it in a way that everyone goes, okay, that's who the Lord has chosen as king. So he has the tribes of Israel Come along, and I want you to imagine a die, you know, like dice when you play a game. Imagine a die that has 12 sides on it. Can you imagine that? 12 sides, and on each side is written the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? And the people come together, and the Lord's prophet takes this, imagine this big die, and he says, the Lord is going to show you which tribe the king is going to come from. And he rolls it. And it lands on the tribe of Benjamin. And everyone goes, okay, the Lord is saying that it will be from the tribe of Benjamin. And then you take all of the clans in that tribe. And then, I don't know how many clans there were, but they wrote each of the clans. And then they throw that down. And then the clan of the Matrites shows up. And all the people go, okay, the Lord has chosen that clan. And then from that clan... You take all the heads of the households. I don't know how big this lot had to be, how many they had to have at this point. He throws it down. It shows that it's Kish, and then it shows that it's Saul, so that all of the people know Saul is the one the Lord has chosen as king. But then, boys and girls, after they cast all these lots and they figure out it's Saul as king, Saul is hiding, 
hiding with all the stuff that the people brought when they came from all over the country to this place called Mizpah. And the Lord, all of you, the Lord further shows his sovereignty in selecting him because not only is he taken by lot, but then the people go, okay, we get it, Lord, you've selected him, but we cannot find him. Is he not here yet? And the Lord says, I'll tell you exactly where he is. He's hidden himself among the luggage. Beloved, the point of why it happens in this way is so that the Lord is showing very clearly to us by a story, this narrative, he sovereignly and providentially puts rulers in their positions of authority. And you need to know, rulers, I'm talking about the civil government in general, rulers are God's idea. The civil government is God's idea. It's not something that people had a good idea and we instituted it. No, God instituted civil governments. His idea, first of all. That's what Paul means in Romans 13, 1. There is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Instituted by God there in Romans 13, 1 means it's his idea, civil government, and each person in a position of civil government has been put there by him. Though there are second causes and though we vote and all of that kind of stuff, the Lord sovereignly chooses who will be in these positions of authority. Our confession of faith that we hold to as a church lays this out. This is because Baptists used to think more than they do now. Baptists used to have bigger confessions. Rather than shrinking them all down, we used to say, we need to cover the span of what God says in his word. So chapter 24 in the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith is called On the Civil Magistrate. Man, Christians need to read that the last few years especially, don't they? Most Christians have no idea what the purpose of the civil government is. And we as Baptists especially should. We have a whole chapter on it in our confession because God has a lot to say in his word about it. This is what it says, chapter 24, the beginning of paragraph 1, and it's mostly the same as the Westminster Confession of Faith. God, the supreme Lord and King of all the world, has ordained civil magistrates to be under him, over the people, for his own glory and the public good. Isn't that beautiful? God, the supreme Lord and King of all the world, has ordained civil magistrates to be under him, over the people, for his own glory and the public good. So rulers are God's idea, and he's showing this further in 1 Samuel 10, 20 through 22. And he's showing that he providentially places those rulers Civil government's his idea. He places them in positions of authority. But not only that, the Lord also removes rulers from their positions of authority by his providence. Civil government's God's idea. Those in civil government are put there by God. Those who are removed from their positions in civil government are removed ultimately by God. That rulers are removed from their positions of authority by the providence of God is taught explicitly in Daniel 2.21. Daniel 2.21. The Lord changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. That's not very unclear, is it? The Lord removes kings and he sets up kings. He's sovereign over that. That rulers are removed from their positions of authority by the providence of God is shown in 1 Samuel. Later in 1 Samuel 15, Saul, who had been selected and appointed by God to be king, he rejected the word of the Lord and would not follow the Lord. So the Lord says, okay, I've rejected you as king. Listen, listen to this in 1 Samuel 15, 28. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. The Lord appoints. The Lord removes. Rulers are 
The fact that they're removed from their positions of authority by the providence of God is both taught and shown in Daniel chapter 5. Now, take your Bible and go to the right, go to the prophet Daniel. I want you to look at these verses. Daniel chapter 5. And as you're turning there, boys and girls, look up here at me. Children, if you need to turn to Daniel 5, go ahead and do that. But if you're not turning there, look up at me. There's a man named Belshazzar. Belshazzar. He was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And Belshazzar was the king of the Babylonians at this time. This is somewhere, kids, around 600 years before Jesus came to the earth. Belshazzar's king, and he's throwing a big party. Can you imagine how elaborate a party would be if it's at the palace and the king is throwing it? It'd be a big party. But Belshazzar did not obey the Lord. He rejected the Lord. He even used some of the items that were supposed to be used in the temple of the Lord. He used these things at his party. And then all of a sudden, Belshazzar looks over at the wall, and this is what happens. Children especially, you need to listen to this. Imagine this. The king's throwing a big party. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. The, then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him, his limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. Can you imagine being at a big party, doing whatever you want to do, having a great time, and all of a sudden you see this finger appear right next to the wall, and it starts writing on the wall. Adults, you know where the writing on the wall comes from. It comes from Daniel 5. Now I want you to look at verses 18 through 28 in your Bible. 18 through 28. After the writing of the, happens on the wall, they don't know what it's about. And finally, Daniel is brought in. Daniel's brought in to tell the king, Belshazzar, what the writing means. And now I want you to pay attention to this fact that the Lord's not only sovereign in putting up kings but also in removing them from their positions of authority. Verse 18 in Daniel 5. O king, this is Daniel speaking. The most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. Now stop there. Who gave Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom? God did. The king of the Babylonians. At first, a wicked king. And he gets converted shortly before he dies. The Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. Verse 19. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. And whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up. Whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. Who put Nebuchadnezzar up? God, the most high God. Who threw him down? The most high God. Verse 21. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast. And his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He, f he was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. Very clear, isn't it? Now continue. And you, his son, verse 22, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this. 
but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods, the false gods, of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose, all, whose are all your ways, you have not honored. Then, from his presence, the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. The Lord is sovereign in appointing kings and in throwing them down. I labor this point because I, I think many believers today don't understand that. Or maybe they understand it theoretically, but they don't actually live like they understand that. They get ridiculously up in arms when someone is appointed to a position of authority that we didn't want to be there. And it's like they're losing their minds and they're losing everything. Everything's crumbling. When, after we have done our duty, we should go, that's who the Lord chose to be there. That doesn't excuse us from duty, but it does comfort us knowing the Lord is the one who chooses who's over us. So you need to know that the Lord providentially, just like he shows here, providentially places rulers in their positions of authority, and he's the one who removes them as well. Now, the reason that point really matters to understand is this second thing that you should learn in 1 Samuel 10. This is from verses 23 and 24. This is the truth that you should gather from these two verses. When the Lord wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. What is the Lord doing here with his people in 1 Samuel 10? Is he giving them a blessing by making Saul their king? Or is he giving them judgment? The answer is he's giving them judgment. And that phrase, when the Lord wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. It's attributed to John Calvin, though he didn't speak English. And even there's not a translation of that sentence from John Calvin. But he does teach it in Romans 13, in his commentary on that, and then in his institutes. He teaches that general truth, but because we like to put everything in a tweetable format, People have summarized it and said, when God wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. And we went, yeah, that's the essence of what Calvin said. And it is. But I want you to look at verses 23 and 24 and see the irony here. We don't know exactly why Saul hid in the luggage. Some people think it's humility. It could be. I'm more inclined to think that Saul is standing there in front of everyone. He knows he's been anointed king. And he knows the lot is going to fall on him. And he hears those first few verses that we read from 17 to 19. He hears Samuel say that. And Saul just goes, I'm going to go. I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go hide. Because he realizes right there, oh, so the reason I'm being appointed as king is because the, Lord have the Lord's people have rejected him as king. And Saul, I think, couldn't help but realize some judgment. Okay? And then he hides. Could be that. He could have had the weight that was upon him, knowing that I'm about to be put up as a king, and he's just, oh. Maybe it's that. 
whatever it is, it's not a good sign. I don't think it's a good sign that they have to go and find him, even though the Lord showed he's been selected by Lot. Look at verse 23. After the Lord says he's hiding in the stuff, in the baggage, then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. I think there's irony in there. This guy that the Lord showed he chose him, and we couldn't even find him. He's hiding. It's like he has to bring him out of the luggage and says, Look, this is who you wanted. The Lord chose this man because he's giving you the king you wanted. He's handsome, he's tall, he's strong, he's a really good military commander, and he was hiding. This is your king. And the people shout, long live the king. Long live the king. What you need to see in this, the Lord, don't miss this. The Lord chose the kind of king the people wanted. This is not the Lord chose a righteous king to give the people. He did that with David. He chose David, a man after his own heart. And he says, I don't look on the externals. I look at the heart. And that's why I have chosen David to be the second king, to be the great king, the king that ultimately is foreshadowing the Lord Jesus Christ. But with Saul, the Lord is not choosing a righteous king. He's choosing a wicked man that is just like all the other kings in the nations because that is what the people wanted. And he's doing it as judgment. Calvin, in his institutes, and this is where the, when the Lord wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. This is where this comes from. He says, we need not labor to prove that a wicked king is the Lord's wrath upon the earth. For I believe no man will contradict me. Calvin says that. Listen to it again. We need not labor to prove that a wicked king is the Lord's wrath upon the earth. Meaning, it's the Lord's act of judgment on those that this king will rule over. For I believe no man will contradict me. You read things like that in church history and it should make you go, Man, we don't know our Bible that well, do we? Because how many of you go, no, I need you to prove that point to me. I need you to prove the point. Calvin just says, are you, are you serious? He even then cites Job 34, Hosea 13, Isaiah 3, Isaiah 10, Deuteronomy 28. He goes to all these places and says, you know this. If you've read your Bible, you know this. The Lord judges a people by giving them wicked rulers. And we don't even have to go beyond 1 Samuel 10. Because the Lord, through the prophet Hosea, comments on why he gave Saul to them. In Hosea 13, 11. Okay, here's the proof of the point. I gave you a king in my anger. He's talking about Saul. I gave you a king in my anger. And I took him away in my wrath. I gave you a king because of your sin. I took him away because of his sin. That's what the Lord's saying in Hosea 13, 11. And that's why Calvin would say, I don't need a labor to prove that point. That is clear. Did the Lord give them a godly king or did he give them the exact kind of king they asked for? A king like the other nations. So you know, you know the answer. As even just last Sunday we examined the life of Saul. Not a righteous guy. I want you to consider also what he says in Isaiah 3, 4. Calvin says we don't need to prove the point. But I think today we probably need to prove the point. Isaiah 3, 4. I will make boys their princes and infants shall rule over them. Isaiah 3 is about judgment. I will make boys their princes and infants shall rule over them. 
That doesn't just mean, boys, and like actually a baby is going to be our president if we're under judgment, but it's someone who thinks and acts like a child. Wouldn't that be terrible if we had that someday? Isaiah 3.12, also talking about the judgment that the Lord sends on a people and talking about the civil government. He says, my people, infants are their oppressors and women rule over them. It is a sign of judgment when women rule over in the civil government. So I'll just ask you, when you consider this truth that the Lord sovereignly chooses who is in a position of authority, shown in verses 20 through 22, when he wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers, as he does with Saul, the kind of king they wanted, as an act of judgment. In his anger, he gave them Saul. Who rules over us today? Who are in positions of authority over us. Just let's go federally. Go to the top. I think right now, most people would agree that our Speaker of the House, who's just been appointed, seems like a pretty good guy. I mean, he's in interviews and they're making fun of him for this, but he's saying, People ask me what my opinion on this certain thing is. I just say, open your Bible and read it. That's my opinion. That's my worldview. I see that. I'm like, pretty good answer. He says, you know, we're going to open every day with prayer and seek the Lord. Seems pretty good. A lot of Christians are celebrating this because it's like, hey, there's one among us. The Presbyterians who are Christian nationalists are saying, The Baptists are all speaking against Christian nationalism, but then they snuck in a Christian prince to be the Speaker of the House. Look at this guy. He's going to do what the Lord says. Probably highest, everyone's like, good Christian guys in civil authority, and he's the Speaker of the House. That man was one of the most instrumental men in keeping abortion legal in the state of Louisiana. This godly Christian man. He literally put pressure on those at the state level in the Louisiana House, called them, put pressure on them to kill the Bill of Abolition in May 2022. Behold your Speaker of the House. Kept abortion legal. He doesn't even have authority in the state legislature because he's a federal, but he called and he put pressure to kill a bill that would simply apply the homicide code to all image bearers of God, and he is one of the biggest instruments in keeping abortion legal in that state. All all I say that for is to say when we look at someone and say, well, it looks like it's getting better, no. Who rules over us today? Generally speaking, you know the answer. And so when we look at our society and we have wicked rulers who would rather trans kids than protect kids in the womb, we need to ask whose fault is it that the wicked rule over us today? When the Lord wants to judge a nation He gives them wicked rulers. The Lord has, I think, the the point's pretty clear. The Lord has given us wicked rulers currently today. Not everyone in a position of authority is wicked. That's not what I mean, of course. But generally speaking, you know the answer. Whose fault is it? Calvin, in his commentary on Romans 13, says, For since a wicked prince is the Lord's scourge, To punish the sins of the people, let us remember that it happens through our fault. That this excellent blessing of God is turned into a curse. Calvin says, let us remember it's our fault that this excellent blessing, by which he means civil government, it's God's idea, it's a good thing, but it's by our fault that this excellent blessing of God 
is turned into a curse. I caution you to be careful on answering whose fault is it that the wicked rule over us today. Be careful in too quickly answering that. Judgment begins at the household of God. And let all of us, each of you, examine yourself. Say, why has the Lord given us wicked rulers today? Don't just look out. First, examine yourself. Last night in family worship, as I was teaching these general truths that when the Lord wants to judge a people, he gives them wicked rulers. And I just asked my kids, what do you think? Do we have righteous rulers? We have wicked rulers. And all of them went, wicked. Even they know. And my question then was, okay, what wickedness, let's just go big picture the United States of America. What wickedness would lead to the Lord then giving us wicked rulers to discipline a nation or to judge a nation? You know what I'm thinking. But one of my kids in half a second said, abortion. Like, that's what I was thinking too, but you got there a lot quicker than I thought you would. Beloved, we are under the judgment of God as exemplified by having wicked rulers over us. And the biggest reason is because just like Israel in 1 Samuel 10, we have rejected God and allowed his image bearers to be slaughtered for 50 plus years. Judgment begins at the household of God. So let's examine ourselves first. Whose fault is it that the wicked rule over us today? I'm the first to say, I think it's our fault. Now God judging a nation doesn't necessarily mean he's condemning or damning them. There's a difference in that. God bringing judgment upon a nation, just like God bringing judgment on someone who profanes the Lord's table, that's not a damning or condemning necessarily. Judgment can be like divine medicine to actually heal the people and to cause them to repent and to turn. This is the purpose of the Lord bringing judgment on his people here in 1 Samuel 10 by giving them this wicked king. At the very least, it makes them long for a righteous king, which they will have in King David and ultimately have in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to know it it may be the divine medicine the people need right now in order to wake up and turn back to the Lord in faith and obedience. And so let this awaken you, this truth. Do we have wicked rulers? Yes. Who chose them to be in positions of authority ultimately? God. Why does he do that? To judge a people. What should that lead the people to do? To repent. We need to examine ourselves and repent. We as a people need to realize that's why we're in this situation. And it's really not a whole lot different than these people were in at this time. Now, I want you to look at these last two things that you should notice in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Look at verse 25. And realize that your rulers have duties owed to both the Lord and to you. Your rulers, even if they are wicked, and the Lord knows they're wicked, and the Lord put them in their positions of authority to be a judgment on the people, they still have a duty to obey the Lord. Does the Lord know Saul is wicked? Yes. I gave you a king in my anger, Hosea 13, 11, right? What does the Lord have Samuel do right after Saul is said to be king? He points him to the scriptures and says, this is what your duty is. You must do this. He doesn't go, well, Saul's a wicked king. He's not going to obey this. He says, no, no, no. This is the standard. This is what you should do. Your rulers, no matter who they are, no matter if they profess to be believers or not, your rulers have duties owed to both the Lord and to you. Verse 25 in 1 Samuel 10. 
Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. He wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Some say that's talking about Samuel the prophet wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And that, that might be, but it might also be that that he there is actually talking about Saul. Because in Deuteronomy 17, it was said that when the king is appointed, the king writes down the entire law with his own hand. And then he gets it approved by the priests and he keeps it and he reads it. Either way, once Saul becomes king, whether that's what verse 25 means or not, he wrote down the entirety of God's law and was to read it daily. To be a reminder of these are his duties to the Lord and to the people. You need to know rulers have duties owed to both the Lord and to you. Rulers are accountable to God. No matter who they are, no matter if they're a Christian or not, you do not wait for a person in position of civil authority to become a Christian before you tell them that they must obey the Lord Jesus Christ. They are in their position of authority because of him, and they must obey him whether they're converted or not. He has delegated his authority to them, and they're accountable to him. So they must obey him. This is why... Paul calls God the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And in Revelation 1.5, John calls Christ the ruler of kings on earth. Rulers are accountable to God. Boys and girls, children, everyone who's in a position in our government, from a police officer all the way up to president, everybody, is accountable to God because he is the supreme king of the world. And Christ Jesus is said to be the king of kings and lord of lords. And so everybody in the civil government especially is accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is also, this is why David says what he does in Psalm 2. Because rulers are accountable to God. That's why he says, O kings of the earth, be wise. Rulers of the earth, kiss the sun, lest you perish. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. This is why Asaph writes Psalm 82, where in this psalm, Asaph pictures the Lord standing before governing authorities and telling them, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? That's why Psalm 82 exists. That's why Paul writes in Romans 13 and calls those in civil rulership, he calls them God's deacons twice. Because they're accountable to him. Everyone's accountable to him. Saul's accountable to him. Saul is not converted here in 1 Samuel 10. He's still accountable to him. Romans 13, who Paul is even writing about in that day, this is during the reign of Nero. He says Nero's a deacon of God and must obey him. Rulers are accountable to God. Now, rulers' duties, generally speaking, are to be under God, over the people, and for the good of the public. Here's another reason that our confession of faith is really helpful. Chapter 24, paragraph 1. God, the supreme Lord and King of all the world, has ordained civil magistrates to be under him, over the people, for his own glory and the public good. That's their general duties, duties, to glorify God and do good to those that they are over. Now, they have specific duties as well. Specifically, this is what the next part of that paragraph says in our confession of faith. And to this end, he has armed them with the power of the sword for defense and encouragement of them that do good, and for the punishment of evildoers. For the defense and encouragement of them that do good, and for the punishment of evildoers. Our confession nails it, because that's exactly what God says through Paul 
are the duties of the civil government, of all civil rulers in Romans 13. Four specifics. Civil servants must be a terror to those who do evil. Romans 13, 3. Civil servants, secondly, must approve of good conduct. Romans 13, 3, the next part of the verse. Civil servants must promote the well-being of those who do good. At the beginning of verse 4 in Romans 13, God says through Paul, for he is God's servant for your good. They exist to promote the good, the well-being of those who do good. And fourthly, civil rulers must carry out God's wrath on those who do evil. This is the role and the duties, and this is, generally speaking, exactly what Samuel laid out to Saul here in 1 Samuel 10, 25. The duties of the kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each to his own home. Your rulers have duties to both the Lord and to you. Now lastly, you need to know from verses 26 and 27, what you should be learning from that is you also have duties to the Lord and to those civil rulers that the Lord has put over you. You have duties too. It's clear in verse 25, Saul has duties. That's explicitly laid out. But I think many people can miss the fact that duties and two different responses are laid out in verses 26 and 27. And this is putting before us, how are you going to respond? Are you going to respond like this group? Or are you going to respond like this group? You, beloved, you have duties owed to the Lord and your rulers. Look at verse 26 in 1 Samuel 10. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of what? Valor. Men of valor whose hearts God had touched. But some worthless fellows said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. You have duties owed both to the Lord and your rulers. And there's two different ways you can respond to civil government that are put forward to us here in verses 26 and 27. One response is by men who have been touched by God. And the other response is by those who are literally called sons of Belial. Maybe your translation translates it like that. Or maybe it just says worthless men or worthless fellows. We translate sons of Belial, worthless fellows, because it's basically like saying sons of the devil. Which worthless fellows is a good, that's what it's getting at. It's common, it was a common phrase used of worthless men who do not love and serve the Lord. Okay, two options. One group has been touched by God and is, they're called men of valor. The other group, sons of the devil. Now, just before you see how they respond, or we think about it, which one do you want to be? Which one do you want to be? Now, I'm going to give you these exhortations to finish from what we learn about our duties owed both to the Lord and your rulers. You can turn all of these into exhortations for you. What should we do with this text of Scripture? Well, we need to realize our duties to the Lord and rulers. First... It is your duty to have an interest in civil rulers. It is your duty to have an interest in civil rulers and help them however you can do the duty God has assigned to them. It is your duty to have an interest in civil rulers and help them however you can do the duty God has assigned to them. Verse 26, Saul went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. There's the positive response. A man is appointed to civil government, and the men of valor who are godly go and help him however they can, and they help him do his duty. 
There's the first exhortation. It's your duty to do that, and you should do that. Second, it is dereliction of duty to be dismissive of civil rulers and reject the purpose for which God has instituted it or instituted them. It is dereliction of duty to be dismissive of civil rulers and reject the purpose for which God has instituted them. Uh, You need to see this. I think many of you need to see this because you don't realize you are derelict in your duty and you are... You are literally sons of the devil. You're acting like sons of the devil right here. Look at these men and why they're called worthless men. Look at verse 27. But some worthless fellows said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. You could be tempted to say they distrusted civil government. That's a good thing. And I would say, yes, that is a good thing. They didn't trust the civil government. That's not what they're doing. God had instituted civil government, and he had said that I'm appointing Saul to save you from your external enemies. And these men say, how can this man do what God, what they're saying is, how can this man do what God created civil government to do and what he told this man to do? How could he do that? They dismissed the role of civil government and rejected the purpose for which God had appointed this man. The men of valor go with him and help him do his duty. The worthless men reject the purpose for which God puts people in civil authority. How can this man save us? That doesn't mean save us from our sins like Jesus has done. It means the duty of civil government protecting the innocent by punishing the evildoer, both foreign and domestic. They said, how can the civil government actually work? Like God has said, I won't have anything to do with it. Is that you? Because maybe even you've seen the wickedness of people in the civil government. You say, I want nothing to do with it. Friend, you fall in line with worthless fellows not men of valor. So examine yourself. Do you want to be a man of valor, a woman of valor, or a worthless fellow? I think there are two ditches that many Christians fall into, and these ditches, I would submit to you, are the main reasons, or some of the main reasons, why things are such a mess in our country right now. Ditch number one. That Chris, I'm talking about that Christians fall into. Ditch number one is trust in the civil government. That's a ditch. Trust in it. Whatever the government tells you, whatever their organizations tell you, they want what's best for you. So just do what the government says. There are many believers who operate like that. That's one reason Beloved, you should not fall into that ditch of trusting the civil government. You shouldn't trust the civil government further than you can throw them. The men of valor who went with Saul ended up disobeying Saul in 1 Samuel 22. They didn't trust him, but they went with him to help him do his duty before God. And when he didn't do his duty, they disobeyed him. In 1 Samuel 22, Saul, the king, turns to his guard and says, kill these men. And they would not do it because they did not deserve death. And then another man that's standing there, who was a wicked man, did what the king said and helped him kill 85 priests at Nob and all the men, all the women, all the children, all the livestock. But the guards who were with Saul said, no. Don't trust the civil government. That's one ditch that many people fall into. Trust the civil government, and that's, I think, why we're in a mess right now. The other ditch on the other side of the road is disdaining the civil government. Ditch one, trust the government. Ditch two, despise, reject, just stay away from the civil government. 
Like, do you know that it's still happening, whether you're involved or not? It's still happening. And do you know who's influencing and controlling the civil government when godly men and women aren't active and engaged in that? The wicked. All of the wicked are influencing that. But it's our job to be like these men of valor, influenced by the Lord, helping our civil rulers do their duty as God has laid out in the scriptures. And when they try to get us to not do it, we say, no, this is what God says. This disdain for the civil government is the same thing as these worthless fellows saying, how can this man save us? Beloved, you and I need to stay out both of those ditches. Don't trust the government. Don't disdain the civil government. God has instituted it for a purpose. It is to protect the good and to punish the evildoer. And when Christians either trust the government or disdain the civil government in general, welcome to 2023. Welcome to hundreds of millions of babies slaughtered in the womb. Welcome to parents being criminalized for not wanting their children to have a gender transformation surgery. That's what happens when you disdain it, as many godly men otherwise have, don't want anything to do with it. Or that's what happens when you trust it and you don't hold it up to the standard of God's word. It's your duty to have an interest. It's dereliction of duty to be dismissive and reject the purpose for which God has instituted it. I know things are really far from where they should be in our society right now. They're really far. But don't act like these worthless men. Say, this is what God has instituted it for. Let's move on. It is your duty, thirdly, to be in subjection to your civil rulers and all things lawful. It's your duty to be in subjection to your civil rulers and all things that are lawful. Is civil disobedience ever necessary? We'll have to wait until next Lord's Day to answer that. I plan to preach an entire sermon on what God has to say in the scriptures concerning civil disobedience and concerning our duty to be in subjection to our civil rulers and all things lawful. But let me move on from those right now since, Lord willing, we'll spend an entire sermon next week on that. It is your duty, fourthly, to pray for your civil rulers. It's your duty to pray for your civil rulers. 1 Timothy 2, 1. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. It is your duty to pray for your civil government. Paul wrote 1 Timothy 2 at the beginning of Nero's reign. You can pray for anybody. You can pray for anybody. You're supposed to pray for your civil government. It's your duty to be in subjection to them, to pray for their good. Fifthly, it is your duty to do all things necessary concerning the civil government so that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. The goal is not to be engaged in civil government and always trying to be troublemakers or saying, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is what we should do. That's not the goal. The goal is so that we would have just laws executed by people who know their duty is before God and they should do things lawfully so that we can live quiet and peaceable lives and godliness. That's the goal. We want just laws our civil government actually punishing evildoers and approving of those who do good so that we can say, we don't need to be troublemakers at all. We don't need to be doing rallies at the Capitol. We want to live quiet and peaceful lives, godly and dignified in every way, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 2. It's our duty to do those things necessary concerning the civil government 
with the goal of being able to live quiet and peaceable lives. We cannot be quiet, though, when our neighbors are being slaughtered and God is being dishonored. Now, in conclusion, let me just remind you that rulers are supposed to save you from your physical enemies by punishing the evildoer and approving of those who do good. Sometimes they succeed, many times they fail. That's their goal. That's what we should be helping them to do. However, there is one ruler who can save you from all your enemies, and he cannot fail. His name is Jesus. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He can save you from your sins. He can save you from even your physical enemies as he executes his office as a king, protecting you, providing for you, and working all things together providentially for your good. This is the king we truly need to look to, and everything must fall under him. Don't trust in the government. Trust in the true governor, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to him in faith and organize your life in subjection to him as the king of kings. Trust in him to save you. Trust in him to rule you and bring everything in alignment with his rule. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We ask you to help us learn what we should from 1 Samuel 10. Help us to be like these men of valor who realize that you have instituted civil government for a purpose and enable us to do whatever we can to help our civil rulers actually rule rightly, to punish evildoers and approve of the good for your glory and for the public good. Help us not to be like these worthless fellows who disdain what you have instituted. We want to be like these men of valor as we trust not in earthly princes or kings, but as we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to not be like these people who reject you and want to be ruled just like the godless people. Help us ultimately to come and submit ourselves to the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask that you save believers, or that you save unbelievers, that you sanctify believers. You purify your church. Enable us now to offer up these sacrifices of praise for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing. We're going to sing Psalm 2.